Academy from Harlem Children's Zone. So we're feeling great because this is, you know, our future is what's in this room. These young adults. We gotta acknowledge them, we gotta give them by example, and they gotta just take a seat at the table and I would say if you don't have a seat, you bring your phone chair and sit your butt down. <laughs> so um, so I would like to hear from, just taking the time, okay, I've got two minutes. Uh, what are your expectations? I need two, three people to just share their expectations for today. Okay, yes, I can start with you. Hello, everybody. My name is Mariamma. I go to Harlem Children's Own Promise Academy. I just want to say that I'm very grateful to be here right now. It's so wonderful to see a community of women from many different places, so many different accents and colors, and you know, it makes me really happy to be here, to know that I could be one of you guys one day. And I am, I am one of you guys one day. And it's just, you know, it makes my heart feel warm to know that like anything is possible, and anything can happen. So yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, thank you very much for engaging and I'm looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have today. And standing before you is Melissa Rubimbo Kuporuno. I'm from Rosaria Memorial Trust uh, and I'm also the chairperson for the Gender is My Agenda Young Women's Network, uh, which is a, a network of organizations that have uh, AU consultative status. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. It's so exciting to see all of you here today and welcome. Um, my name is Lucy uh, Chikowero. I am one of the adult organizers. I'm from MTC and I also work with Rosaria Memorial Trust. Um, this event is for young people. As you can see, our panelists are young people. We have been talking about bringing the girls to the table. Bring, and we've been talking over and over again like, as to we, young women and girls are missing. So, as Rosaria Memorial Trust and as MTC, we have these young people. We want to hear from them what they want. Why you all, why you guys bought the plane tickets to be here? Um, so I'm so excited to be hearing what they're going to present on. Also, um, without further ado, I want to acknowledge the presence of our Deputy Executive Director of UN Women, Dr. Nyara Tsai Thank you so much for being here. Um, I would like to also acknowledge uh, the Harlem Children's uh, Academy, right? Did I say a school call? Harlem Children's Zone. The Promise Academy. The Promise Academy. They both finished their education, correct? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is so exciting. We are going to have some girls who could not be here. We understand that girls were missing on the table. We understand the visa issues that are happening right now. Um, young women and girls are not getting visas because they don't have proof to show that they are going to come back to their countries. They are still young people. So they are missing on the table. But as soon as we get our systems going, some of them send their videos. And some are waiting to connect are from Zimbabwe right now. So we'll be excited to be hearing what they have to say because when we talk of poverty, this is part of poverty. When they are missing from the table, it's part of poverty. Um, I would like to also acknowledge my, my fellow panelists. Like I said, this event is not mine. I'm not even supposed to feature in the picture. <laughs> it's going to be moderated. It is an event for young people, by young people. And it's going to be moderated by college students. Most of these girls that are sitting up here are high school students. So you guys, you are next in line. <laughs> and um, without further ado, I would like to invite the CEO of Rosario Memorial Trust uh, to come and tell us a little bit about Rosario Memorial Trust. Um, greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to our event. My name is Michelle Rubimbo Togo. I'm the executive director for Rosaria Memorial Trust. We are an organization that is based in rural Zimbabwe, and we work with young people, and we work with 
women, girls and young women um, to ensure that they have access to their rights. So we are on, not only just working in Zimbabwe, we also have RMT USA, where we have a girls club and we have young people who are also at the forefront of claiming their rights within their own spaces. Um, we do work around economic empowerment to women. Uh, we do work around ensuring that victims of gender-based violence have access to the services that they need, access to the referral pathway. We run an emergency shelter. We work with girls to do movement building. We do what we call a nanga, which is the safe space for girls where we promote intergenerational learning between young people and people who are older, who have more experience. And we do this so that they have information on mentorship, on age-appropriate SRHR information. And we work with them to ensure that even when they are not accessing the formal education, they're still getting all the knowledge that they need to get uh, when it comes to claiming their rights, when it comes to access to education, yeah. access to health, we assist with access to justice. We promote child protection. We're working with girls to remove them from child marriages. We work with a lot of girls who are at risk for child marriages, so we also just try to ensure that girls in rural communities are not getting into child marriages as a result of issues like poverty as a result of them not having access to schools that are near. So we are addressing these issues at community level and also at regional and global level. Um, and we're very excited to see young people within this panel uh, who are representing MTC and also Rosario Memorial Trust to speak about their issues. We always want to see young women, young people being co-creators <coughs> of the solutions to the issues that, af that affect them. Um, as Ms. Chikoero said, this is not our space um, to be speaking mostly. We want the young people to speak for themselves. So I'm not going to take up most of the time speaking. Um, I'm going to hand over to the moderator, um, Maka, uh, so that she can start the program. Thank you. <coughs> Hello, everyone. And thank you so much for joining our panel, Understanding Poverty and Inequalities in Girls' Lives for Girls and Gender Perspective. My name is Maka Chikawero, and I'm a sophomore at St. Catherine University and the founder and president of MTC Educated Girl Aid. Hello? Okay. Oh, perfect. Uh, and I'm Michelle. I'm currently a sophomore at uh, the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, studying finance and ESGB. And uh, Mock and I were actually moderators last year and both speakers two years before. So we're really excited to be here again. We have an amazing group of young leaders here to address issues of poverty and can't wait to get started. First up, we have Olivia. Olivia Alator is an 18 year old and a writer, poet, actress, who is in her fourth year of high school. She's passionate about reading and writing, which led her to acting in the acting industry, where she discovered her love for performing and storytelling at the age of four. She uses her power for words to advocate for justice worldwide conferences, such as the International Day of the Girl Child and the Commission on the Status of Women. Over to you, Olivia. Thank you for having me. Um, as said in my bio, um, my passion really lies in writing and speaking and advocating, and I think that's all why we were kind of drawn here is the power of our voice kind of brought us all together. And the way that I like to use my voice the best is through poetry, so I prepared a piece um, called Gaps that was inspired by the gap in my front two teeth that I had. <laughs> my grandma died and left me her teeth. Not in a jar or a case, but in the smile of my own. In what I saw to be a flawless smile accessorized with a gap, others saw a lack of beauty. Subjecting me to the state of denial that my gap smile is what could make me pretty. Words whistled past my front two teeth. My confidence fizzled week by week. It was an insecurity of mine that held a history much deeper than where my teeth met beneath my gums. It was ancestral. Passed down from generation to generation, a frown made no association with a big, gappy smile like mine. The gap, like twine, connected me to the smiley ancestors of my past. But then, some time passed and everyone at school asked, what's wrong with your teeth? And then the smiling stopped. 
I felt insecure, was never too sure if I met the expectations that were set for girls like me. I look in the mirror, got nearer, and it became clear that the gap between my front two teeth was not the only one. I aligned my teeth with braces to get in line with the expectation of perfection. My gap was not the only one. My entire life I felt the disparity between girls and boys. Wage gaps, pink tats, my gap was not the only one. As a biracial girl, I straddled the binary world of stereotypes. Not black enough for my black friends and too black for the others, my gap was not the only one. Girls face standards, expectation, sexualization too hard to erase. You can't dismiss it that girls are taught to be submissive before we even know what that word means. This is the story of a girl's grin that wore her confidence thin but built it right back up again. The work I've been doing on my gapped grin, a symbol of the progress you must begin of all the other gaps around us. Thank you. Women often face social, economic, and political marginalization, limiting their opportunities for growth. Socially, stereotypes and biases restrict their roles. Economically, wage gaps persist, limiting their financial independence, and politically, representation gaps hinder their influence. Impoverished women bear an additional burden by facing intensified social gaps as limited resources create bigger challenges and bigger gaps, you know, creating a cycle that underscores the importance of addressing gender-based biases and disparities. 2018 was the year that I began working with the United Nations to advocate for adolescent girls and women's rights. For me, it all started with the United Nations International Day of the Girl Child, as mentioned before, and I was able to fulfill the role of being a girl performer. Now, at the time, my job description, I guess, would be to perform a speech and um, a, an artistic way of storytelling for girls' voices around the world. My eight years of experience in acting prior and also undiscovered passion for love, for writing, had gotten me there. I felt slightly uncomfortable in my own skin as a girl advocate because I'd never really done it before. Since then, I have started clubs at my school, joined organizations, um, organized fundraisers, and expanded my reach as an advocate. Um, and I even had the opportunity to deliver keynote speeches all around my county and um, you know, build my network from there. Looking back, I was naive to think that the majority of my advocacy would end there. I am forever grateful to my mentors and friends who saw potential in me and asked me to return to the United Nations uh, for my most recent event being International Day of the Girl Child 2023, where I was connected with these wonderful panelists. This reminds me why we gather here today. We gather here today to recognize the worldwide gender inequity and inequality that has led to 70% of the nation's impoverished people being women and children. That's over 380 million women and girls living in extreme poverty, not, include, not including the total of 1.2 billion women and girls who live in places where safe and proper health care, like abortions, are restricted. You know, and these lead to over 25 million unsafe abortions taking place each year. Not to mention the 12 million girls who are forced into child marriages each year as well, leaving women in a place where we're not too sure where to go or who to turn to, what to do next. That's a whole lot of numbers and only one solution, to work together. Let us unite in breaking the chains of these inequalities. I urge you to advocate for policies promoting gender equity, supporting initiatives empowering economically disadvantaged women to amplify the voices of these women in political spheres. By fostering inclusivity, we pave the way for a society where every woman, regardless of your socioeconomic background, can thrive. Now is the time to bridge these gaps. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Olivia. You are amazing. Today we are joined by Dr. Nyarazai Gumbonjanda, the Deputy Executive Director of UN Women. Dr. Nyarazai Gumbonjanda is a global thought leader on issues of economic, social justice, human rights, and peace. She's a champion for world human rights and gender equality through intergenerational leadership approaches, community voice, and transformation. Dr. Gumbonjanda is the former African Union Goodwill Ambassador for Ending Child Marriages, former General Secretary of the World YWCA, and founder and former Chief Executive of the Office of Rosario Memorial Trust, and former Action Aid Board Chair, among many other hats that she wears. DED, thank you so much for joining us today. much for the organizers for inviting me. It's hard. I know that today I'm speaking as the Deputy Executive Director of UNDM, the Assistant Secretary General, for issues of women and girls around poverty, around financing, institutions. It's hard to be born in a rural poor community. It was hard. It was it was hard when you lose a father and you are in grade three and your mother is your pillar in your family and brothers and sisters are your pillar. It's tough when the world assumes equality uh, of opportunity and some of us were able to climb the bus when we were almost 15, 16 years old to go to the city. Another world is possible, including for rural girls in poor communities. It was tough just being there in the middle of the war, the war of liberation of my country, Zimbabwe. It's exciting to be in this room when for the last 15 years I've been coming to every CSW and would come to the 11th floor to advocate for women's rights and for gender equality. Congratulations to all of us. Congratulations. Amazing to see Sydney, to see Maka, to see Yilda, to see uh, Mama H. Henrika, to see Fulata, to see many of us. And especially the young girls who were like 10 year olds. And today you are running a whole session in the Commission on the Status of Women. So, you and women, when it was set up, it was to advance the empowerment of women and girls, including having your voice in decisions which affect your lives. The Commission on the Status of Women is one of those spaces where women and girls must have a voice on issues that affect their lives. Congratulations for being here. We also know that when UN Women was founded, it was also clear that we need to remove the barriers, including the barrier of poverty that limit participation. Today, many girls and women could not be here <coughs> because of so many barriers. But those barriers can be removed. I have a barrier when I walk, I struggle, so I have to use a crutch, at times I have to use a wheelchair. But there are moments when you just throw it away. 
And it's possible there are those who are not here because they are poor, they cannot afford, they cannot afford a ticket, they cannot afford technology to just know what is happening, they cannot afford the bus to go to the city to apply for a visa, they cannot afford it, they cannot afford We can and we must address poverty because it's limiting participation. There are those who could not be here because they are bound in the social constructions of patriarchy. You can't travel if your boyfriend is saying no. There are some people who are self controlled by even their boyfriends. You can't travel if your father says no, if your husband says no. So the right to participate is also embedded in the social dynamics of existence for which women's rights is subordinate to the social status and their economic dependence within the context of the family. This is why this commission on the status of women 68 is so important when we focus on economic empowerment for women and girls so that they can have opportunities to make their decisions and then negotiate the social, but from a position of power and a position of empowerment. As UN women and at the CSW, we are also very clear that when we talk about financing, we are starting from the premise of recognizing the contribution that we all give in communities, the unrecognized undervalued, unaccounted care work, which is done by girls, which is done by women in our communities. The, the economic analysis talks about people surviving on a dollar per day. But what is not mentioned is that even if you have a food basket of a dollar, there's a woman who is giving eight hours to go and fetch the water, to go and fetch firewood, to cook the food, to feed the people. All that work is unrecognized and unaccounted. Women are subsidizing the economies of our nations. Mm -hmm. Girls are not going to school because they have to care for their loved ones, because they are married off, because they are raped, and we call it child marriage. So essentially, this commission on the status of women needs the voices of the girls to dismantle the analysis in order to provide the issues that are dear to your heart. But lastly, we, at the end of the two weeks, we have what are called <coughs> agreed conclusions. All the governments would have to agree to reach some agreement around issues of poverty and financing. Please talk to whoever you can talk to, to your governments, to make sure that the issues of girls and young women are in the decisions which the governments are going to make. So whatever comes of this meeting, please share it with us. Let's bring it into the negotiations. I see Nyari Mashayamombe there. And she even hears something she wanted to give, where the girls have been speaking, the girls have been raising issues from different parts of the world. We need to receive <coughs> the voices and the experience of women. Lastly, there are many girls who are in refugee camps, who are in displaced camps, who are unable to have a meal today either because of the war or because of the extreme poverty. We, in this room, together, and us in the United Nations, have to call out that war is violence against girls. War is violence against women. We need a humanitarian ceasefire 
in all the countries where we have war so that girls can access opportunities. This year, we also know that 60 countries are going, over 60 countries are going into elections. 1.3 billion women are going to vote. And some of you would be turning the voting age by the time your country goes into elections. Understand including this country is going into elections from the US. Vote for women. We need an increased number of women in decision making. Vote, <coughs> vote for governments that believe in gender equality and on women's empowerment. Cast your vote to advance gender equality and women's empowerment. Make the issues of girls ending child marriage, preventing teenage pregnancy, preventing abuse, preventing gender-based violence, resourcing women's organizations, make these issues electoral issues. Ask that party, what is your position in your manifesto about girls? Ask the questions, because that is how we transform institutions and societies. UN Women is in a number of countries, in all the regions. Please reach out. Um, I cannot complete this conversation without saying, Michelle, uh, Michelle Mutogo, can you come over? Uh, and Melissa, uh, and Lucy. Uh, I just wanted to say, it has been the most difficult day for me not to talk about Rosaria Memorial Trust. <laughs> uh, this is Rosaria Memorial Trust, run with the baton. Make sure these girls continue to be in the room. Please continue to hold the hand of this, these girls who are just bringing the voices from communities to say another world is possible. Thank you so much. DED for your time. We love and appreciate you so much. And to say thank you, we do have a gift just for you with all the love. So many chocolate sweets all for you, but thank you so much for all your time. So much chocolate. <laughs> Wow, I mean, I think all of us here probably resonated with every, everything that she said. Um, I think one thing that really stood out to me was just her talk on barriers, right? I mean, all of us overcome barriers to come here, whether that was so socioeconomic barriers, physical barriers, gender inequality barriers, or even physical barriers like myself when I missed my train to New York to come today from Philly. Um, I think it really just emphasizes the importance of young women's voices in the conversation, in the greater conversation regarding gender inequality and with this year's CSW theme, poverty as well. And so I urge everyone here to really take in DD's words and listen to our amazing young panelists today. So on that note, um, I will be introducing Sydney. Uh, so Sydney is a 
16 year old high schooler, <laughs> but an advocate with businesses focusing on teen mental health and girls empowerment. She is a Rosaria Girls Club member and a member of CEOs of Tomorrow, a nonprofit that works to inspire the next generation of community minded leaders. She's super excited to share her insights from interacting with young women and teenagers, co learning about entrepreneurship, and how to make our own businesses. So give it up for Sydney. Like Michelle said, my name is Sydney and I'm 16 years old. So what is poverty really? Now don't go looking up the definition or anything, but personally when I think of poverty, I think of not having the bare minimum for a decent quality of life. For example, the lack of health care, education, food, shelter, or sanitary items. In my own community, I've seen people not having access to medicine, or classmates not having breakfast or lunch when we're not in school. Or even when I went to the Gambia and five-year-olds were begging us for books and it hurt my heart to know that something I had shelves upon shelves of at my house was something that they so innocently craved. Globally, around 388 million women and girls are living in extreme poverty and the projections for the future aren't looking great. That's 388 million women and girls suffering to just get by every day. I believe that non-traditional education about entrepreneurship and girls empowerment can help lower that number. But who am I to be a change agent? Who am I to believe that one young woman from a working class family can have any effect on the trajectory of well-being and financial quality of life of girls? But really, who am I not to? Girls and women's lives and futures are at stake every second of every minute of every day. Entrepreneurship has changed my perception of the world. And I think and know it can change the perception of women and girls that are in poverty or are struggling. Being an entrepreneur is so much more than just owning your own business. It's having leadership and communication skills. And it teaches you discipline and financial literacy. To me, entrepreneurship is having the freedom, is the freedom to have something that you create. It's yours and you're in charge. I created my own small business called Sydney's Girl Power Inc. I inspire, motivate, coach, and share empowerment tools to lead girls to success and share how I overcame difficult situations. My three steps for success for entrepreneurship is having an idea or passion, a business model, and a support system. Those are the key things I had and needed to make my own business. This summer, I had the opportunity to travel with nine other teenagers from around the world, from around my community to the Gambia, Africa, for two weeks through a program called CEOs of Tomorrow. We went there to teach young people and teenagers about entrepreneurship and how to make your own business. We helped them make businesses that address social issues in their community from deforestation to not knowing how to read. We hosted a pitch and lunch for their businesses where, where they had to pitch their businesses to judges who picked a winner. Whether they won or not, the judges gave them feedback to think about to improve their businesses. Not only did we teach them things, but they taught us so much as well. The students taught us about their culture, traditions, and way of life. Being in the Gambia and really immersing myself into their culture and community was eye-opening, especially because the teenagers there showed us that making their own business can improve poverty. Entrepreneurship helps to increase access to financial support, offers goods and services, establishes jobs, and aids in sustainable economic growth. I truly do believe that learning these skills change parts of their lives, as it has changed mine. The whole experience of going to the Gambia was life-changing, and by far one of the most unique and incredible opportunities I've ever gotten. Additionally, girls' empowerment is such a key factor in girls' and young women's lives. The way we see ourselves can make or break us in all areas of our lives, emotionally, financially, economically, and more. The amount of girls who report feeling confident has dropped 13% in the last five years, and fifth and sixth grade girls experienced the largest declines in confidence and self-perception. 
Between their tween and teen years, girls' confidence that other people likes them falls from 71% to 38%, a 46% drop. Growing up as a girl is really difficult, and I can relate and sympathize, but it's even harder for girls and women in poverty. I promote girls' empowerment because no matter where you're from or your socioeconomic status, you deserve to feel confident and feel good about yourself regardless. It takes a community to raise a girl, and these girls around us need your help. They may not always ask, but they shouldn't have to. We need to implement more spaces where girls can be empowered and uplifted using tools like the tools I use in my business. We also need to make designated places where women and young women can be taught and assisted in learning to be entrepreneurs. Thank you so much, and I wouldn't be here without all the people that paved the way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sydney. You're right, we do have to advocate for young girls just like us, and your experiences in Gambia are inspiring. Grace Jo Stables is a current junior at Marymount Manhattan College and the lead U.S. intern for Widows' Rights International. Pursuing a degree in international studies, Grace's research also includes global health and healthcare access, Latin American politics and issues of disarmament, democracy, and demilitarization, and plans to pursue a career in international humanitarian work and policy. Over to you, Grace. Uh, hi there. Um, my name is Gracie Jo Staples. Um, I'm a current intern with Widows' Rights International, as Maka said. Um, I'm also the oldest person on this panel right now, um, feeling, feeling a little bit aged, won't lie. Um, so, oh, thank you, thank you. Um, when I thought about what I wanted to say today, my mind came up empty-handed. Not because I have nothing to say, but because there is no way I could explain to you what it was like growing up in poverty. What it is still like growing up in poverty. Part of me wanted to tell you all about how even though my family was too poor for groceries, we were richer in laughter than any man could comprehend. But then another part of me felt like poverty was a dirty word, a word I tried so desperately growing up to avoid. So here's what I've settled on. Poverty felt like foot cramps. I spent some years in shoes that were entirely too small and I'd wear holes into them from those days of constant use. However, it did not mean my childhood didn't also feel like sore bellies from laughing until you were out of breath. Poverty felt like hunger. If you ask me about my memories of middle school, the only thing I could use to describe those memories was hungry. When you can't eat, food is the only thing you think of, especially when your body is already growing faster by the day. However, that doesn't mean that my family never got to eat, and I dare anyone to tell me my dad's barbecue is not the best in the world. Poverty felt shameful, but it was never shameful because I was poor, only because of how people look at you when they know you're poor. It was never shameful because I was poor, but it was shameful to have your friends call you dirty and your richer peers tell you to just get more money. Poverty felt shameful, but not because it was. Poverty felt shameful because people told me I should be ashamed. Growing up in one of the poorest states in America, in the poorest region of the country, I understood poverty from a girl's perspective faster than many of my peers in school. Currently, there are 388 million women and girls in extreme poverty, compared to 372 million boys and men. To put that in perspective, that is more than the entire population of all of Central America, by a wide margin. Being a girl in poverty means you learn a little too fast about the world. You learn a lot too fast about where poverty puts you in the grand scheme of the global hierarchy. The bottom of the totem pole, hanging on by the thinnest thread above a den of hungry alligators that probably haven't eaten since you last have. But above all else, you learn that how the world perceives your economic standing is vastly skewed. The rhetoric around poverty is always the same. Just pull yourself up by the bootstraps. No one wants to work these days. Or, if you're the President of the United States of America in the 1980s, you just have to wait for the wealth to trickle down to you. <laughs> now I would like to expand upon this from the perspective of the girl that these comments have been made to. Firstly, pulling yourself up by the boot bootstraps is pretty hard when you do not have boots to begin with.
every day, 16 billion hours worldwide are spent in unpaid care work. Women and girls carry the bulk of that. It is these kinds of statistics that show us that bootstraps are not available to everyone, nor are they something that you can just invest in getting. With work being continuously unpaid, undervalued, and underestimated for women and girls, investing in themselves is impossible. With no capital to do so, poverty is inescapable and not something they can just pull themselves out of. Secondly, the idea that no one wants to work. When women are 30% less likely to be considered for jobs than men, and with that number rising higher based on how many kids she has, it's unlikely that no one wants to work, but it is increasingly more likely that no one wants to close the wealth gap between men and women. 700 million fewer women than men are employed in the formal sectors. To be clear, it is not for a lack of trying. Women experience 10 times more structural barriers than men in accessing the job market. For every move she makes is criticized. From her family, to her clothes, and even the way she wears her hair are all cited reasons for not hiring a woman. How are women supposed to find employment in formal sectors when perfection is expected from them and faultlessness is demanded? Often this leads women and girls to pursue jobs in the informal economy where labor is unpaid and the hours are excessive just to make ends meet. It is not that women do not want to work, it's that corporations do not want to hire them. However, just because this is how things have been done previously does not mean that this is how we must accept them. As I have stated previously, I have understood poverty from my girlhood, and since then, I have been able to identify two key areas in changing its perception. One, changing the way we think of its origin. Poverty is not the cause of an individual fault. Poverty is not the fault of the majority. Poverty is the cause of wealth hoarding in the minority. I cannot and will not make peace with the fact that girls cannot afford to go to school, cannot afford period products, and cannot afford food when it only takes about $30 billion a year to end hunger, and Jeff Bezos holds $150 billion. <laughs> Poverty is not someone's own fault, but the fault of the roughly 3,000 billionaires who are doing nothing to eradicate it. Do not blame the impoverished. Blame the richest if you must blame anyone at all. And two, changing the way we think of its solution. Poverty cannot be eradicated by a single girl pulling herself out of it, nor can it be eradicated by just finding a job. The solution to ending poverty must come from the intentional care for women in the workforce, and the intentional expansion of it. All social issues are collaborative issues, and poverty is no exception. I would lastly like to leave you with a quote by Albert Einstein. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. <laughs> we have spent our lives in advocacy, fighting to make things that no one wants to hear heard. It's insanity that we continue to do it. But we must continue, for the world we dream about and the one we live in now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, it was, I mean, I don't really have words to say how impactful your story was. I think it's really easy to kind of, first of all, share that kind of story. So thank you so much for sharing. I'm sure all of us can say thank you for that. But I think mostly what really stood out to me from your presentation today was your last words. I think especially in a group like this, working towards change like this, it's really easy to kind of get caught up in everything and really hit that roadblock and feel like you aren't really making an impact. And I think in those times, it's really important to look at your peers and look at the people around us and see, oh, this is why I'm doing the work that I'm doing. Um, and Grace, I am very, very excited uh, to see you pursue your career in international humanitarian work and policy, and I'm sure you'll be doing amazing things, so thank you. So next, uh, we have Lola. Lola Hernandez is a teen activist and proponent of equitable access to resources among people of different classes and ethnic backgrounds. She's a member of Rosaria Memorial Trust and a high school senior. Lola's academic interests are fueled by a desire to understand how sociocultural influences might shape beliefs and predispose individuals to mental health issues. Lola strives to, to create spaces that produce a globalized sense of growth 
challenging structural inequalities. <coughs> Give it up for Lola. All right, thank you for that. Um, I'm Lola, as she mentioned, and I'm a member of Bizarre Memorial Trust, along with Maka, um, Olivia, and Cindy. I'm super appreciative of the opportunity to be here, and um, I guess I just wanted to start off with something that I've noticed throughout the past few events I've attended, um, which is that there's a lot of discussion about the problems that we're facing, but a lot less over the specific solutions we can take to solve those problems. Um, and I understand that it's not simple because our issues stem from a series of systemic interrelated barriers, but I do think it's important to put some ideas out there. Um, so while what I'll be sharing isn't necessarily the solution, um, it is a step in the right direction. Um, so other than being a member of RMT, I'm also a board member of By Youth For Youth, which is a cohort of 16 female high school students across Dane County, Wisconsin. So By Youth For Youth, or By Five for short, is a program through which young people make investment decisions in programming across Dane County. Our work culminates in the pecuniary um, support student led slash organized initiatives which are selected through a process of a grant application. Um, so essentially as a board member of BiFi, it's my role to collaborate with local nonprofit organizations and be involved in community groups to identify critical issues facing youth in Wisconsin. One of the primary issues is poverty, which affects 22.6% of Dane County residents. These individuals make up only a fraction of the 38 million people in poverty. <laughs> Poverty exists due to a host of underlying conditions, including regional disabilities, um, and opportunity, racism, and a lack of educational and vocational support. Food insecurity, homelessness, and mental health conditions all thrive as a byproduct. With this knowledge, the board meets by weekly to discuss possible solutions and tested ways to reduce the impact of poverty on um, over the course of our meetings, we've established five of these priorities by several we found to be the most prevalent in our stories. Among these, we have poverty, immigration, climate change, mental health, and sexual assault. <coughs> in early December, our grant application opened to the public. Um, we received a total of 32 grant applications for youth-led or youth-affecting programs, with requests totaling over $86,000. We then reviewed and deliberated upon um, funding proposals, ultimately narrowing down to 11 applications to recommend the funding. Among these, we'll be covering utility bills for a year for a single Afghan refugee mother of five, providing them with the individualized, family-specific aid which refugees need but rarely receive. Funds will also go, go towards the implementation of an aquaponics system in one of the most poverty-stricken public schools in our area, which will eventually supply over 200 students with healthy eating options at little to no cost. Um, this upcoming Monday, we'll be presenting a funding proposal to the city of Madison. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, Madison is Wisconsin's capital um, and the Department of Human Services. If approved, our proposal will be allocated a total of around $25,000, which will be split among these 11 chosen projects. Um, the implementation of these projects will provide vital humanitarian resources for over 2,000 individuals in Dane County, many of whom would otherwise not have access to the resources. As young people, we are the future of policy. That being said, it's fundamental that we become socially aware and learn about the problems that affect our society. I encourage you all to go fur further in your search for the truth, to look not only at statistics and reports, but instead take the time to immerse yourselves in your own communities becoming the subjects of your own research. Only while experiencing these issues firsthand will you realize their gravity and be motivated to act in favor of change. Making ourselves uncomfortable is the first step to progress. On the other side of this coin, we have our governments, the individuals who are in charge of prioritizing the welfare of our country's constituents. Um, I urge all governments to create and prioritize initiatives that involve student voice and to allow youth to become involved in decision making particularly concerning legislation that affects them. It's increasingly important that the student perspective is involved as we work to reach the sustainable development goals. Collaboration is the essence behind establishing institutions that work. Collective movements have more power than the individual. For that, I commend everyone for showing up today and every day in the face of progress. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lola. Your work is incredibly important and you're paving the way for other young people in your spaces. 
Policy makes change and we are change makers. Barriers are all around us and we're taking the right steps forward by addressing poverty, especially it impacts young women and girls. We are now joined with Dr. Fulaki Musungo Moyo, a feminist ethicist, a Ubuntu scholar, activist, researcher, and widely published author. She's a member of the Pan-African Alliance for Ending Child Marriages, founder of the Cinema Stream, and the community-based response servitude of trafficked, trafficking that forced, focuses on female survivors, company mentorship, and the vice president for all Afri Arms, Milak. Inspire, lead, and advocate for change. Thank you so much for joining us. I think as, as an elder trying to give a response to brilliant young voices, I better stand <laughs> <laughs> and, and encourage myself. <laughs> um, thank you so much, uh, all of you, for being here. But I, I want to start by saying, please, can we clap for these young voices? I'm Pulada, as I've been introduced, and I'm giving a response, not because these young voices have not been clear, but because, you know, in a way, their voice has pointed to some things that we, older women, have to deal with. And I think uh, one of the things I wanted to start with was to ask these, our panelists, any of you um, were given the book of Cinderella or Little Mermaid to read as your favorite books? You were? Okay. Any of you parents who gave your children this kind of books? Yeah. I mean, Cinderella. <laughs> Sleeping Beauty. Any? Okay, okay, okay. Uh, it's not a judgment day. <laughs> but uh, um, but uh, looking at these young voices, these young women, I don't think if they believed that they had to wait for Mr. Wright <laughs> to resurrect from their sleep, they would be here. And, uh, and I think this is one of the things that I wanted to raise with us as grown-up women and men who raise children. That, you know, it matters. It matters how we socialize our children. It matters a lot. Because these children, these young women and, and girls, um, had, they have something within them that the older people like Rosario uh, Memorial Trust programs had to co-empower. Because empowerment assumes that there's nothing in the people that you are empowering. But co-empowerment, I believe personally, that it means that you recognize there is, there is uh, energy, there is strength, there is, there is something within the young people that you have recognized and you are trying to nurture that to come out and you create the space for the voices to come up. And I am so encouraged today. And following up from what uh, the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the vice executive director of UN Women said, I want to say that I am a woman who was born in Malawi. My mother was married at 12 years of age because of poverty, because she had to find a solution to her problem. And the only way for her was to find a man and be married to him and then think that he the poverty will be sorted out. These young women we have here, they don't need to find a solution to someone by, by uh, 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 aligning themselves and or, or frustrating their own dreams so as to, to be rescued. These young women, actually, we just need 
to support them and to be here with them and to listen to them because their voices, what they have said today, I wouldn't have said. I wouldn't have said and made sense uh, to anyone of us. So I want to say three things that I think we really need to, to think about seriously. I am, I've been introduced as a feminist ethics, ethicist of Ubuntu. And I know that most of you know the Ubuntu, that it is, I am because you are, since we are, therefore I am. But most of the times what we don't know is that because of the patriarchal nature of our community, Ubuntu most means that the I am because you are, and since you are the I am, is mainly the male experience rather than my experience as a woman. So being a feminist ethicist of Ubuntu means I'm taking the intersectional <coughs> approach to everything that I do. So for these young voices, we have listened to them. What they have said, some of the things that they've brought up is the way that gender, because of gender injustice, the way they have been stigmatized and being marginalized because of their gender has been one issue. The second issue has been what, what probably we can actually allude to from their stories is also that there are issues about age. So they have been marginalized because of age. They've been marginalized because of maybe the color of their skin. They have been marginalized because of the origin of their community where they come from. So when you take an, an, an intersectional approach, you are acknowledging that each individual has different layers of belonging. And those layers can either work for you as a privileging or can work against you as a marginalization. And in most cases, you can be privileged today, but tomorrow you might be disadvantaged. It depends on the context and whatever is happening. <laughs> so I work with the Afri Ozi IDEAC, uh, and the, I have a team here that are here. Afriozi Iliak is inspires, it leads, it, it, it educates, and it advocates for change. And we run programs. So in Afriozi Iliak, we acknowledge the fact that actually it takes the core empowerment element, means that you have to also create the space for the participation of young voices. So, we, so what we do is we create a space for young voices to be co-empowered. The second thing that we also do is to make sure to acknowledge that actually these multiple belongings uh, are, are marginalizing so many people. So, but I want to uh, finish by saying, young ladies, please lead the way. This change you are bringing, we will support you and work with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pulata. And let's give a big round of applause to our panelists. We're going to welcome in the next three speakers. So if you've already went, thank you so much. And we'll have time for question and answer at the end. But we're going to welcome up Aliana and Lolly. <coughs> Mr. Lucky. We're going to start up first with Lolly. Lolly is 17, born in Bedfordshire, England, and currently studying politics, sociology, and psychology at the College of Cambridge. She's part of many youth programs, including regional, national, and international programs. 
Over you, Ellie. Like my bio is slightly lacking compared to other people's, but that's okay. Um, so I'd like to start off by saying thank you to our hosts for the opportunity to speak today, and to my fellow panelists for their insightful contributions so far. We literally learned so much from you all. So, to start. Um, in 1953, at the age of 20, my great-grandmother Gloria became a widow and faced raising two little boys on her own in a country where women had few, few rights and widows even fewer. For my great-grandmother, this meant no longer having social protection for herself or her two sons, no longer having access to a stable income, and being considered lower than a second-class citizen. And we still see this happening to women and girls all around the world today. In low-income countries, widows are often overlooked, marginalised, and they're the brunt of poverty and poverty. The death of a husband is a crisis for a widow, who has to now adopt roles with which she's not familiar, becoming the head of the family, the sole breadwinner, and ensuring her children's education, security, health. If we want to dismantle the structures that keep women in poverty, we have to address the needs of widows as widowhood is both directly and indirectly linked to most of the sustainable development goals. Widows face poverty, food insecurity, and are unable to provide for the health and wealth, welfare of herself and her children. And if they can't pay school fees, they sometimes turn to child marriage for social protection and money. However, this is not always the case, as in some communities, such as Afghanistan, for example, there's a social pressure to uphold the practice of child marriages. Failure to conform can bring ridicule, disapproval, shame, and loss of status to the family. Even if the girl is so young, she's still holding her toys on her wedding day. Whether they're forced into it for social or economic reasons, it still remains common in rural areas, among the least educated and those most affected by poverty. Some of the consequences of child marriages of risks to the health of the girl, the increased risk of domestic violence, it reduces her options and economic prospects and limits educational opportunities. And education is often said to be this great equalizer, yet it remains a distant dream for many girls trapped in the cycle of poverty. Even in my own college in the seemingly wealthy UK city of Cambridge, Girls in minority groups are less likely to achieve the same grade standards as their local majority classmates, leading to lower paid jobs and continuing this cycle of poverty. In other parts of the world, lack of finances, society's expectations and cultural practices often keep girls out of the classrooms altogether. Also, the problem of period poverty has an impact on girls' education, where they're unable to afford sanitary products that would enable them to go to school. We must recognise that educating girls is not just a matter of justice. It's an investment in the future prosperity of communities and nations. So, poverty, as an ever-present global challenge and number one of the sustainable development goals, serves as a formidable barrier that restricts the potential and opportunities of countless girls across the world. And these manifest in various ways, affecting their access to education, healthcare and even their safety. To address these challenges, institutions need to make the targeted efforts that are required to empower communities to break down these barriers. Personally, I've taken part in many youth programs and from those and the talks that I've attended this week, I've learned that in order to achieve this, we must challenge harmful societal and cultural, harmful societal and cultural norms invest in grassroots programs that give women and girls full agency over their futures, develop unique solutions that are culturally and socially appropriate and sustainable, and dismantle the structural laws and policies that perpetuate gender-based discrimination, and advocate for policy, policies that promote inclusivity and equality. Investing in girls is not only a moral imperative, but a strategic decision that benefits societies at large. When girls are educated and empowered, they become catalysts for positive change, breaking the chains of poverty and contributing to the overall development of their communities. And this is exactly what my great-grandmother managed to achieve. And now I'm able to be here today, along with my mother and her mother, doing what we can to serve our communities and make these changes. 
And when I talk about empowering girls, I also mean me, my sisters, my cousins, my friends, and every woman in the room here with us today. I mean every girl. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, I think obviously education is such an important topic, especially in regards to poverty, gender inequality, and thank you so much for sharing your story today, Molly. And that subject of education leads us to our next speaker, Aliana. So Aliana is also, we went to high school together, which is kind of fun, but um, Aliana is a high school senior from Eastern New Hampshire. As a Muslim Bangladeshi German American, Aliana has grown up appreciating the need for intersectionality when regarding societal issues, particularly feminism. At Exeter, Aliana is a co-head of the Feminist Union, which I was also a co-head of during my time at Exeter, and Salam, an affinity group for Muslim women. So give it up for Aliana. Hi, um, again, my name is Aliana, and I'm going to be elaborating a little bit on a topic that Ali already touched on, which is the relationship between poverty and access to education, and particularly how that affects young women and girls. Now, this topic is quite personal to me because of my family's own experiences with education, particularly the women in my family. My maternal grandmother, who grew up in Bangladesh, wanted to go to university. She had the grades, the intelligence, and her family even had the money. But her parents did not think that she, as a young woman, needed to go to university. So they stopped her and thereby contributed to her lack of financial opportunity and independence later on in life. Then, just one generation later, my own mother had to put her education in the United States on hold because she could no longer pay college tuition and needed to start working to support her family. She was, however, lucky enough to go back to school after a couple of years and finish pursuing a higher education. And so I have these two stories of educational barriers with my family, once because of gender discrimination and once because of financial difficulties. And these two stories are ones that you see over and over again across the world. Lack of access to education is a major predictor of passing poverty from one generation to the next. And receiving an education is one of the top ways to achieve financial stability. Poverty and education are inextricably linked and poverty often disproportionately affects educational access for women and girls. Families living in poverty often have to choose between sending their child to school or providing other basic needs. And even if families do not have to pay tuition fees for school, school comes with the added costs of uniforms, books, supplies, and or exam fees. And if families cannot afford the costs of school, they are more likely to send their sons than their daughters. Of the children that will never get the chance to attend any school, Around 15 million are girls, compared to 10 million boys. And around the world, 129 million school-aged children are currently out of school. But as much as we can focus on this negative lack cycle of lack of education and poverty, there's also a positive flip side to this issue. Because studies have shown that educating people, and specifically educating girls, not only lifts them, but also their entire communities out of poverty. 60 million people could, could escape poverty if all adults had just two more years of schooling. And 420 million people could be lifted out of poverty if all adults completed a secondary or high school education. And research shows that specifically providing girls with an extra year of schooling, just one extra year, can increase their individual wages by up to 20%. And so it becomes clear that educating girls and eradicating poverty are mutually reinforcing goals. By empowering women and giving them access to education, we can help the financial standing of their entire communities. So, I urge everyone to recognize the intersectionality of issues relating to gender equality, particularly the intersections of poverty and gender discrimination. I also urge you all to support organizations that help girls receive an education, and the support could take the form of volunteer time or financial donations. One um, organization that I wanted to highlight is the Campaign for Female Education or CAMFED International, which is a pan-African grassroots-led movement that tackles poverty through both girls' education and also women's leadership. The UN also has their very own organization focused specifically on girls' education, called the Girls' Education Initiative. I would also encourage you all to support schools that are specifically focused on helping and educating women and girls from underserved communities, like the Asian University for Women in Bangladesh, which aims to graduate highly motivated women who will lead the fight against poverty within their own communities. Thank you for listening.
Thank you so much, Eliana. That was beautiful. Education is a tool and knowledge is power. Education positively impacts everyone around the world child, not just her. Next, we are joined by Mr. Lucky Mbewe, a social development activist by profession, specializing in youth, children, adolescent girls, and women in town. Mbewe holds two master's degrees in public administration, project management, and a degree in managing rural and community development. He has 20 years of experience leading civil society advocacy, including conducting awareness campaigns for meaningful inclusion of young people and children in policy development and implementation processes. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, moderator, uh, and all the distinguished participants to the SAD event where we are talking about the realities of poverty among its adolescent girls and young women. In fact, from the speeches that have been mentioned and spoken uh, since we got here, it is not news that indeed girls face enormous challenges to realize their potential. We meet, we talk about them, we speak about them, but the bottom line, they continue to go through different problems each and every passing moment. And of course, it is not news that uh, poverty and inequalities in, in, in adolescent girls and young women pushes them to the tail end in as far as participation in policy, decision-making, implementation, monitoring and evaluation. And of course, in the fight against poverty. The question is, if they are at the tail end, how do we expect them to meaningfully participate? They need to be empowered to come out of the poverty that they go through each and a passing moment. What we have listened to, I see and, and, and I feel in the shoes of many, many adolescent girls globally that uh, are facing quite a lot of inequalities as they strive to see the next money as they strive to achieve quality education, as they strive to attain the necessary skills for them to be counted. In other words, as we speak, many girls are not counted out there because of poverty. And I believe giving them the necessary education, creating space for them, giving them the platform to speak out and engage is the only way that will lead to alleviate the poverty and the problems that they are going through at the moment in time. There's so much in as far as injustices among adolescent girls and young women. We have spoken a lot about age-appropriate, comprehensive sexuality education. Who decides about age-appropriateness? Are they engaged and consulted? The answer is no. We need to give them space to speak about their feelings and to express the problems that they go through, so much so that policies must be made and designed and implemented within their interests and aspirations. I look forward to such a time when the other conference like we're attending today would be championed by adolescent girls and young women speaking to us about the changes and the impact that has been there as a result of the policies that we come up with, the policies that we implement, the uh, funds that we allocate to support their programs and, uh, and, and the initiatives elsewhere. However, regardless of the fact, I feel there's hope our coming and our gathering here at the CSW 68 is the first step in terms of creating hope because we have allowed them to speak what is it they feel, what is it that they go through each and every passing moment, their vision, their passion. Our role this afternoon is therefore is to translate their feelings, their passion, their expectation, their vision into reality. Gone are those days when we have been coming here, discussing all these issues, and they end up here with a clap of their hands. They end up here 
with quarreling on what is it that is good for them, it ends up here with how much is to be allocated to them to drive their agenda. But now is the time we need action. Action and action. In conclusion, I want to put it on record that uh, well, uh, based on the issues that these able girls have spoken, on behalf of their fellow girls elsewhere, it is true that access to education is a challenge to many of them because many of them, they are living in hard to reach areas where technology, modern technology and whatever we are talking about is difficult to reach them. In other words, we are talking about them not being able to access services like sexual reproductive health and rights because of stringent policies that we have continuously cleaned on because we have not opened up to speak to them, dialogue together, discuss and come up with issues from the household and outside on what is it good for them. It is true that issues of sexual gender-based violence continue to push them to serious problems of poverty because they cannot exercise their rights and potential, just like each and every citizen out there. Many of them, the victims of harmful cultural practices, talk about female genital mutilation, initiation uh, practices that continue to happen across the world, regardless of our meetings here, to discuss and to transform them. There's need to change the reverse law to allow them to exercise their rights and potential. If we do so, they'll have access to participation, they'll have access to decision making, they'll have access to decide what is good for them. Without which, the principle of nothing without them cannot be realized. I appeal to you all to support the girls who come out of poverty. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Murphy, for that. Um, I won't elaborate any further because I think that's just a wonderful note to end off on. So um, before we move into Q&A, can we just get a, another round of applause for everyone who spoke today? Yeah. Wonderful speeches. Wonderful to know every one of you. Um, so yeah, opening the floor up to any questions that people have. Okay, perfect. Hello, and I was wondering if there were any programs that support women for eighth graders going on to high school, like me and my friends. So my school is Promise Academy One from HCC. Uh, mine is a comment to say, well done, young people, young women, um, and everyone who came here to support. And uh, thank you very much for the support uh, from the gentleman as well. Uh, you raised a lot of issues, and particularly education, and the participation of young women and girls, powerful stuff. And just to wrap up with what the gentleman said, to say, we want to see African girls and young women being the ones running. This is how it looks like. We are running the show. And tomorrow, uh, at 10.30 a.m., some of them, we have RTM, uh, we've got an event with the African young women as well, are coming together to hand in a petition. It is so beautiful that uh, Mam Nyaradzai is the deputy director because we worked on this program before she, I mean, she was in transition. So the African young women are coming together at 10.30 tomorrow to hand in a petition demanding a space at the table to be recognized. So I invite every one of you here uh, because RTM is already a partner. Uh, if you want the flyers, we'll give you um, to come tomorrow and see them passing on their petition, demanding the things that you spoke about, demanding the things that you spoke about, uh, young women and, and young men who spoke here. Uh, so thank you, well done, and clap hands for yourselves. Uh, I have a question about um, victims or survivors of sexual abuse. I, I grew up in poverty, alcoholic parents, um, was a victim of sexual abuse for most of my childhood. By my brother, I went on to education, I got a doctorate, but my whole life I'm plagued by the sexual abuse. I've been in and out of therapy, but I wonder 
in addition to providing girls educational opportunities, are there programs that help them through the emotional trauma of the sexual abuse? Thank you very much. Not precisely a question, but a comment briefly. Uh, my name is Dr. Stephen Kojesaki, uh, eminent peace ambassador, African for Calpoint to the United Nations, International Association of World Peace Advocates. Uh, I'm a humanitarian as well, because my background is in human rights, conflict, and peace studies. And being an educator, I've worked with a girl child, actually I taught in secondary school, where women were dominating. So anything about gender, I'm very passionate about it. And I have a, a philosophy that if the world wants to be peaceful, then we must begin to give women a lead in mediation process and conflict resolution, because anything you give to a woman, it will multiply it for you. It's a fact. You agree with me. It is a fact. Anything you give to a woman, you multiply it for you. If you give a woman a problem, it will multiply it for you. <laughs> and if you give a woman better things, they will continue to make it more peaceful. So, talking about poverty, there is no virtue in poverty. And there is no way we should see our girl child suffering in any ways. Because these root diseases are the causes of conflict in the world. The inequalities, relative deprivation, and all the things that we can name off are the things that drive conflict in the world. And women can champion in this area. How can they champion these issues when they are empowered and they have the right mindset to listen to these young girls because some of us we started since 1998. I was the co-founder of United Nations Youth Association in Ghana. And we have empowered the women. We have those platforms. So this is the time which we need to give these women a chance and support. And men can do that. If men advocate for that, we should not feel threatened that our positions are taken away. Let's create the space for them. Let them give the women the leading role. And the world will be a safer place and a peaceful place for all of us to live peacefully. God bless you, the organizers, and all of us here. Thank you very much. Hello again. Um, so my question is for um, the presenters here. So how does it feel to be able to be in the moment and to understand that there are problems that need to be solved and being willing, being willing to fight for them? Because I feel like for me, being young, I deal with a lot of, like being able to see these issues and these problems makes me want to like, escape from them and just not want to deal with them completely. But to be brave enough to you know, step up here and to be completely present, to be completely in the moment. Like, what makes you, like, what really, how do you feel from from doing that? What what type of, um, like, what is a, yeah, what is the motivation, yeah, to be able to do that and to stick with it? Um, we can give 30 seconds and 30 seconds, then we'll go back to the panelists. Well, mine is just a question to the Rosario Memorial uh, club members. Uh, I understand you're in Zimbabwe and Ghana, I mean Gambia. How are you intending to uh, expand to other countries of the world because we need you? Thank you. Yes, um, quickly to take up the, the, the last question. I come from Malawi, where she is also coming from. We've been running a program together, a regional program with the Rosario Memorial Trust on a campaign against child marriages, funded by the Swedish uh, development partner. And the, there are quite a lot of stories and successes. I'm sure that's a step further in uh, expansion of uh, RMT programming in, in other countries. Thank you. Um, for the question about motivation, um, my motivation is just that I have no guarantee that anyone else is going to do it for me. Mm -hmm. So I have to do it for right. myself. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, for me, um, the motivation really, it, it's uncomfortable to be in this, these positions. It's, you face a lot of um, struggles in your life, especially the girl being raised in the States, especially I would assume as a woman of color. 
Um, and you have to take that oppression and use it to create change. You have to take all those feelings that you're feeling and put them towards something that's better, something that will make other girls not feel that way. So that's kind of my motivation. And then as for your question um, about um, like institutions that deal with sexual assault, like the like feelings behind it, um, for example, the program that I'm from, Bayou for Youth, we don't necessarily come up with the solutions, but we fund um, youth-led programs um, that are meant for that purpose. So, for example, we have, um, there's this one school in our district um, that has the highest population of poverty-stricken individuals, and there's a lot of students there that have faced um, sexual assault or domestic violence, stuff like that. Um, we founded a kindness retreat for them, and these are elementary school um, students. So we're starting young and providing them at least with the money to support a place where they can be with people that can help them. So my motivation, so it definitely is difficult to like stand up here and speak to a bunch of people and not just in this space, but in other spaces. But I have learned to realize that like what Grace said, if you don't, then who will? And there's no guarantee that anybody else will. And so like I refuse to sit back and watch no one else do it. And my voice needs to be heard, and so does yours. And <laughs> Just to add on to that, I think that change is not something that happens overnight, but at the same time, change is not a waiting game. We have to act now or, you know, or then it becomes a question of when. And that's never a good, um, you know, thing to procrastinate. In, um, but yeah, I think your daily motivation could be in the world around you. It's just looking at the people around you, seeing how you can um, make an impact on those and how, what you can do to change. Okay. Um, I think in terms of finding motivation, community is also a really great place to find that support, especially just a couple of generations ago. We wouldn't have had this kind of community of activism, but nowadays we have those structures more in place than they would have been in the past. So really take advantage of all the people around you who want to help further uh, champion the good causes. Um, to approach what Eliana said and to answer your question, um, I'm a member of Baha'i Faith and we run these books for what we call JY, Junior Youth, so ages 11 to 15, and it's all about navigating the world around you and morals and things like that, and anywhere you go, you can find the books, someone will be running it, and it's all for people your age, and it really, it fueled me personally, because you learn about different issues in the world, and there's no way to avoid wanting to change the world, everyone wants to make it a better place, right? So. Uh, okay, so I will just answer the last question uh, that was also on uh, what we're doing in terms of gender-based violence uh, and survivors. So at Rosary Memorial Trust, we've got an emergency shelter. Uh, we, uh, when when a, a survivor of gender-based, any form of gender-based violence uh, experiences that, they actually come uh, to the shelter. And then we also have place a, a place of healing, which we call Nanga. Uh, and I think we can then discuss bilaterally more, but this is uh, a, a space that we create in different communities and also in schools as girls clubs, where uh, girls can openly share, since it's a safe space, openly share and also have mentors who actually provide counseling, but we can discuss more uh, even with the high school uh, students so that we can find ways to collaborate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much to our wonderful panelists. You were so awesome, and I'm so proud of you. Thank you to our moderators. You ran the shit out of tight ship. Uh, and I want to thank everyone for attending this event. Uh, for the girls uh, who want to join Rosetta Girls Clubs, uh, you can get my business card and reach out to me. Uh, we can we'll meet over Zoom because we have uh, the Rosaria Girls Clubs here in the U.S. everywhere in this country. So we can just uh, connect uh, on Zoom. Uh, we can connect via WhatsApp. We can connect via um, social media platforms. You can follow Rosaria, Rosaria Connects uh, on Facebook. You can follow also MTC Educator Girl Inc. Also on Facebook. Um, 
I always thank you so much for attending and another big honor of our boss to all of you. Thank you. You can send by the door, someone can pick a little bottle of some goodies. It's not me.